There's nothing better on a Saturday than to look across the screen there and see Ryan Welton. Good morning. How are you doing? I got to see my head is like, all right, now I'm even with you. on the right. My friend that uh, we're talking Saturday, it's Beyond the Bell, which we're doing every other week here on News 9, News on 6, every available platform, which I think, and, and I'm going to introduce our great panel. We're throwing everybody in this morning because our panel's smaller than the last couple of weeks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Before we do that, so I've got people arriving on an airplane tonight about 7 o'clock. Anything going on? And, of course, I'm tongue-in-cheek. There's some weather concerns today, correct? You bet. Uh, and, in fact, I'm just uh, looking at some of the, the uh, uh, information provided by your Oklahoma weather experts, News 9 meteorologists, and it looks like all modes of severe weather are possible today. And it feels like today could be a more active day than what we've had in, in quite a while for the Oklahoma City metro. Um, last night, Chief Meteorologist David Payne's tornado zone or his uh, severe weather risk zone was really that standard I-44 corridor going from, uh, you know, Grady County on up through the metro, on up to north central Oklahoma. The concerns in eastern Oklahoma are more about flooding uh, on, on the southeast part of the DMA. Uh, in the Tulsa area, we're talking like LaFleur County, Pushmataha, Pittsburgh County, uh, later tonight and overnight. But I would say uh, for folks in the Oklahoma City metro area, be paying attention after 3 o'clock this afternoon. Um, have your weather app, have the notifications turned on. Um, this could be a very active day. It sure could. And one of the things that we were talking earlier uh, with, with Senator Stanley, who you'll meet in just a moment, our entire gang, we were talking about platforms. And for those who've been on this Beyond the Bell before, we've probably heard this before, but it takes, you know, we're, I think media is, there's real smart media, which is trying to be on every platform that people are on. And as you know, I, as I explained to a lot of friends, you know, this is where people get their news. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so news nine news on six, you're on every platform for folks who might want to see this in the future. Could you run down just how many places that people can right. find that beyond the bell? Well, the good news about this particular Facebook live, uh, is that it will still be on Facebook. So if, if Facebook is your jam, you can watch this again right there on Facebook, but we clip this and put this on the news nine news on six website our news app, and on our streaming app. Some people call it OTT, over the top. If you haven't downloaded the News 9 and News on 6 Roku, Amazon Fire Stick, or Apple TV, I believe it's even available for Android TV, uh, over the top streaming apps, please do. This is, this is where you watch your Netflix, your Hulu, your Discovery Plus, whatever you might have. Not the CNN Plus, that no longer exists. But uh, I will tell you, News 9, News on 6, and it's free. It's out there on your streaming app. It's a great place to uh, watch the digital components of what we do, like Beyond the Bell, and do it on a big screen. It's very cool. And so if you if you can't find us, give us a call. We'll, we'll help you find out a, a place. 100% will. So the first person I want to introduce, uh, in, who was first in line this morning, is Senator Brenda Stanley. From out here in our part of the country, I think she just may have become my senator. Uh, because of redistricting, has been involved in education for 43 years. You started at five years old? I did. Okay. So it's really great to have you, Senator Stanley, who is understands what it's like out here. It's urban. You know, the Choctaw uh, traffic jams, we don't have that many there. But I'm between Choctaw and Jones, and so she's my senator now, and this place is growing out here. Um, price per square foot in homes is still going up. So it's good to have you, Senator Stanley. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Let me also bring uh, into our stream this morning, Dr. Vanessa Anton, who is the uh, Dean of the College of Education at North, uh, Northeastern State University. And it's good to have you, Dr. Anton. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Glad to have you. Uh, also, and we were just working on the connection a little earlier, John Hazel. Do I pronounce that correct, John? You got it correct. Thank okay. you. Okay. The 2017 Teacher of the Year, and you've seen him in op-eds and doing all kinds of things, talking about the pipeline. And uh, Senator Jessica Garvin from down there in southwestern Oklahoma, down uh, in the right there where the Buffalo Run Bill. Good to see you, Senator. How are you? Thank you. I'm so so well. So blessed to be here. Great to have Especially you. Especially with one of my favorite senators. 
I figured y'all knew each other. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> you know, we're talking, have been this last week about this uh, workforce development in Oklahoma. And as part of workforce development, working on that teacher pipeline, and there's been some shortages. You've seen the stories. Uh, teachers need resources. They need salary, that livable salaries, all of these things we're talking about that doesn't seem to get as much publicity as say project ocean coming to Northern Oklahoma, which is, you know, Panasonic, we all know that. All right. But equally important are the people who are going to be turning out the professionals. Mm -hmm. Panasonic's not going to just be taking anybody. I mean, education is key to people wanting to come here. So we're talking teacher pipeline today. Take it away, Ryan. You bet. And before I get started, just a, a big thank you to every kid counts Oklahoma who is sponsoring these beyond the bell learning sessions. One of the things I love Scott said before the show is this isn't a, this isn't a, a, a toxic environment. This is a learning environment. And I've got questions for everybody. And the first question I have, and I'll start with you, Senator Stanley, is from your perspective, what are the biggest challenges in terms of teacher recruitment and retention here in the state of Oklahoma? This would be a good one for everybody. Uh, Senator Stanley, if you'd like to go ahead and start with that one. Yes, teacher recruitment and retention, biggest challenges in the state. It is a huge challenge, and that is uh, very concerning to me. I moved to Oklahoma in 1986, and at that time, we had uh, lots and lots of applications for teachers um, applying to be um, in our school districts. We don't have that anymore. We do have a shortage. In fact, Oklahoma City University just suspended their teacher education program. Very concerning to me. Um, people are not going into education. Sometimes it's their fallback uh, profession. They major in pre-med, they don't make it to medical school, they have a biology degree, and then they go, well, if I can't get into med school, I'll just teach. Mm -hmm. Teaching is not just, I'll just teach. It is a noble profession. We have great teachers out there in our classrooms right now. We need to make sure that teachers and the profession of education is given the um, respect that it is due. Certainly money plays a big part of that. But what I'm hearing um, out in the district is not so much salaries, is that they are um, wanting the respect and the nobility <clears throat> of the profession to come back. And that's our job to do it. Um, school districts are working on that. I know they are. I just had a conversation yesterday with one of my superintendents how they try so desperately to make um, the school district and the individual site levels a family friendly place that people want to work. I think we have to make sure though, that we do incentivize teachers with the appropriate salaries, with our inflation rate at its highest that it's been in years. We have to be able to offer competitive salaries for our teachers to, so they can buy a home, so they can pay for their health care and be able to afford their health care. So we have um, an opportunity here in the state. We just funded last year our highest budget ever in the state of Oklahoma into education and then put in an additional $50 million at the end to make um, our educational opportunities for teachers more appealing. We've got to do that. We need to fund more um, into education. We're working on that. I think we've got some programs going and some bills working through the Senate and the House to incentivize teachers. Uh, one of them being um, first an additional thousand dollars for their first three years. We're also looking at paying for student teaching. We know that teachers go into the profession. You have to have a semester of student teaching. They typically have second jobs. We've got to make sure that they're able to keep their lights on at their homes and pay their mortgages, pay their rents, rent. So we're doing some things in, in uh, the legislature to make sure 
that we incentivize people to go into teaching because it is a great profession. I loved every day. I never thought about the, that I was going to work. I was always going to school and I loved going to school every day. So thank you so much for having us on here to talk about these issues. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Anton, from your perspective as Dean of Education at NSU, what is the current state of the teacher pipeline and, and what can we be doing better in terms of recruitment and retention? Well, uh, it, it's a lot. <laughs> I know there's a whole lot of people who've been working on this, um, including many of those on this, on this broadcast. And we've got a lot of collaborative partnerships now between um, educator preparation programs, also known as teacher education, EPPs, uh, P-12 school districts, state agencies, uh, such as the Regents, they have their Teach Oklahoma program and their Educators Rising, and we also have versions of that. Career tech, I mean, when we talk about the pipeline, there's a lot of pieces. So there's a lot happening. But one of the challenges from my perspective is that th it's a lot of piecemeal um, and not necessarily things that are available to everyone across the board in the state. Um, over the last several years, we all know that the number of completers uh, through educator preparation programs have declined significantly, um, 30 to 35 percent since 3, 000, probably 13, 14, but it, it goes back even further than that, um, around 2008. If you watch that graph, it just goes down. Uh, and, and I also need to say, though, that it has stabilized some for, for some universities. Um, NSU is up 4% since 2019 in uh, those completing teacher education at the undergraduate level and 27% at the graduate level. So, um, and that doesn't just happen by accident. We're, I mean, it's all hands on deck time. Um, some of the numbers are alarming. And, you know, at the same time, we know that emergency CERT has increased exponentially. Um, you know, I have that bar graph where it's color coded and it, and it goes back to 2011 or so where there was just a handful to thousands now. And the truth is that those numbers more than double the numbers that are coming out of all 23 EPPs added together per year right now. Um, so that's something that, you know, obviously we is a challenge now. When I say that, I, I also want to put in there that I know that there are a lot of people. I mean, we're all in the same. We're all our goal is the same. Uh, we want educated children who become, you know, awesome members of our society. And that's that's the bottom line. So that's where we all come together on this. Um, and so what I was going to say is with emergency cert, you know, kudos to those folks who are trying to help. I mean, uh, we have to have teachers in the classroom, but I'm trying to talk about, I think, flipping that narrative of where do we and how do we, with long-term intentional plans, um, flip what is happening? Um, because it it matters. I mean, it's critical. It's, it's absolutely critical. Um, so when you think about the pipeline, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more as we go through and I can tell you what we're doing, what we're trying to do, but um, you know, the, it needs to come all the way through uh, P through 12 um, and to grow your own programs into two plus two agreements with two year college and four year colleges. Um, and then on into mentoring those um, graduates into the teaching field and then on into incentivizing them to stay. So it's a really long pipeline and it, it takes it takes time and it takes a lot of effort. But from my perspective, coming at it from an EPP standpoint, that's that's where we are. Thank you very much. John, I wanted to ask you, you 2017 Oklahoma Teacher of the Year. Um, how has that impacted your passion for teacher recruitment and retention? And what is your perspective on the state of both right now? First of all, it really didn't impact my passion. I already had that passion before I was uh, teacher of the year. Uh, I just didn't have the scope and the voice uh, and before that I was 
uh, selected as teacher in a year. And so that gave me a voice and it, it widened my scope and allowed me um, to do a lot of things. I've been involved. It would take too long to explain all the things that I'm working on now and the people that I'm working with to try to do this. But a couple of things that I will share with regard to the question that you asked. Uh, one, of course, I mean, that's what people talk about. And we kind of like blow that off and then we go to other things. But that's something that we want to, if we want to restore the honor and the respect of teachers, we have to show them that we honor them and respect them by paying them a living wage. And so that can't be overlooked by something that's going on in our society right now. And kids are not dumb. Kids are smart. And I'm not going to get off in the weeds here, and I don't want to blame anybody, but education has become a political hot potato. And everybody is just, you know, trying to use it. You see people complaining about it. And kids sit back and they look at this. And they go, why would I want to be involved in something that is so causing so much trouble and so controversial? And so a lot of kids look at that and say, I just don't want to get involved in something that is so politically charged right now. They just they just don't want to do that. That's not something a young person wants to do. And then third thing is this. One thing that I see as an educator working with young students for almost 40 years, while I still work with them every day, just not in the classroom where I was, is this. We're not really getting the perspective of the young students and asking them, why would you consider becoming a teacher? Why would you not consider becoming a teacher? What is it that keeps you from thinking about entering the education profession? Uh, just like any company that sells a product, they go down and they interview people to see what people's interests are and what they want, you know, and what they, what they would be willing to invest in. And we're not going down and doing that with kids. We do some, and I know we have Teach Oklahoma and Project Teach and those things, but as a general rule, we're not going out and surveying and finding and getting the attitude of the kids. And especially, here's what I learned. We don't hit the kids young enough when we get them to ask them to start thinking about education, we do it so late in their career that by then a lot of them already have their mind made up and it's just not something that they think about. And we've got to find a way to start reaching out and getting to these kids at a younger age and finding out what their interests are and what they might cause them to consider those things. So there's a lot of things, but that's one of the biggest problems that we have is the, the respect for teachers that shows itself in pay and then forgive me, but I got to throw one more thing in here, too. Over the last 40 years of my teaching career, here's what I saw. The freedom that I had to do my job the way that I knew to do it was eroded very much so over the time from when I started in 1982 till today. And what happens is everybody comes in and they have the fix for education. And the fix for education is we're going to add these five or six things to your plate. And if you'll do these five or six things, that'll fix education. Doesn't work. So the next group comes in. They've got the fix for education. And so they're going to add five or six more things to my plate. But the problem is they didn't take the five or six away that didn't work from the last group. And so pretty soon after 20 years, I've got 40 new things that I have to do as an educator that have been added to my plate. Nobody's taken away any of the things that didn't work. And so teach your autonomy and teach your freedom. You know, and the ability to teach is, you know, it's, it's become a process of data collection, not an art. And just like, you know, we're always telling teachers, kids learn in different ways. And I spent 40 years trying to try to figure out the best ways that kids learn so that I could accommodate each child. Well, teachers, kids just grow up to be teachers, but we all function in different ways. And we can't all teach in an A, B, C, D, paint by the numbers pattern which is kind of what has been happening to education in the last several years. I know we have to have standards. I understand that, but standardization is going to kill us. And that's one of the biggest problems that we have is yes, I agree with standards, but we are trying to standardize everything. And it's really running a lot of people out because they don't get to do their passion. They just walk in and somebody hands them a, a, a manuscript and, you have to follow this manuscript and they really don't get to do what they were trained to do. Well, not taking any of it away. It just makes for more paperwork for you, which I'm sure you enjoy paperwork ah, once standards that you, you can't imagine the, the, the way paperwork has increased in, in my teaching career. You can't even describe the amount of paperwork now as compared to when it was, when I started. Could you, could you give us just an example? Give us some perspective on how much more than when you started. 
<laughs> I, you know, I know that we have to have standards, like I said, so a lot of people are going to skewer me on this. But for example, when you have special needs or special education children, they have an IEP or an individualized education program. And all teachers have to go through that and, and see what the accommodations are for the students and all that kind of stuff. But just one example. And yes, it's extreme, but it's not that extreme. My last year in the classroom, I signed an IEP for a student that was 142 pages long. And that, that IEP, I had, to, I had to know all these different things. And as an educator, I know what that student needs to learn in my classroom. I don't need 142 pages of instructions to tell me that they may, did, may need a little bit more time to do this, or they may struggle with reading, and they may, may do that. I'm a well-qualified, good edu educator that does that. All the reports that I have to turn in, uh, for example, uh, lesson plans have gone from, you know, pretty simple things of what we were going to do and how we were going to do it to almost having to write a book. And when you, when you walk into a classroom, any experienced teacher knows that that lesson plan is probably going to go out the window in the first five minutes of when you walk in that classroom because of what's going to happen in the classroom and how everything is fluid, what you have to do. And so I'll be honest with you. I don't know about other teachers. I'm, the professionals really skewer me for saying this. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. But it just killed me to go through this and have to fill out all this paperwork and turn all these things in when I knew that it was going to change five minutes after I got into the classroom with what I was going to actually be doing. And as I saw what the students were understanding, what they were not understanding, where we were going to have to go, um, it's just a, a friend of mine said that his wife has taught for 40 years and she said that lesson plans are just a plan to be abandoned about five minutes after you get into the classroom. But lesson plans, IEPs, the stuff that we have to do, my teacher evaluation system, my last couple of years in the classroom took hours upon hours to just do the teacher evaluations as compared to when I first started. Uh, I could go on and on. I'm not getting into enough detail on any of this. But there is just immense amounts of paperwork. Uh, that kind of goes back to the respect for teachers. That is put into place, to be honest with you, and I'm going to say this, because teachers aren't trusted anymore. And so they're not trusted. So we got to prove you're doing your job. we got to prove that, you, that you're doing these things. we got to prove that you know what you're doing because they don't trust us and they don't, don't respect us in the classroom. So we've got to hand them all this data to prove that we're actually doing our job. That's the long and short of it. Well, that's a lot. So, and if, by the way, so to apologize in advance, if Senator Garvin, we're having a lot of trouble with her stream. So she jumps back in, whoever's talking, Ryan, I'm just going to jump in and get her. She's author of some legislation. So we're having some difficulties. So if we get her back in, we'll put her at the front of the line. But Senator, let me, uh, uh, Stan, let me turn to you. What are the prospects of getting some of this career uh, ladder education that people are wanting, getting it done this, this legislative session? I think it's um, I think we're going to have a great opportunity this legislative session. And I want to applaud what John said. You're exactly right. You don't need a hundred and forty page. I think is what you said. IEP to tell you how to teach a child. <laughs> I've been in those meetings I've, for years, set in IEP meetings and even to schedule that is almost a nightmare because if you've got that many pages, you've got that many services just about coming to that child. And you know your children in your classroom. I think we've gotten away from knowing our children, realizing that as educators, we know what we need to do for each child. We don't need a plan written out for every child that walks through our doors because we know, and you're right about your lesson plans too. I have teachers turn their lesson plans into me on a weekly basis, but I also knew that could change within seconds. When you see a teachable moment with children, you've got to have that opportunity and the freedom to do that with children every time, every day, because you get more valuable um, instruction that way than you do following a piece of paper. And Brenda Stanley may teach it opposite of John, how you're teaching, but we both can get the job done and we don't need somebody telling us how to fill out a piece of paper to get that job, um, job done. I recently had an opportunity to sub in our local school district. It was wonderful. 
the children were wonderful and it was middle school and I made it. I can do elementary all day long. I can do high school, middle school. When I was assigned there, I thought, Oh, this may not be so great. They were wonderful. The faculty, the staff, everybody was on board helping me to uh, get the schedule down. I think you're exactly spot on when you say we don't have the respect in the teaching profession that we used to have. And I think part of that is not welcoming parents and having their involvement in schools. I loved when, children, when parents showed up for any reason to be in my school, to see what was going on, because I was very proud of my teachers, very proud of my staff. They knew what they were doing. As a result, you know, I know we talked about accountability and standardized testing. We had the highest test scores in the district. A lot of that was due to the fabulous teachers I had on staff and parental involvement. That has got to be a key for our children is getting the parents in the building, letting them see what's going on, making them feel welcome to be a part of the process. I always enjoyed that conversation with parents. I think this legislative session we have, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, we have a bill in the pipeline right now that would do away with, um, it would let local school districts do their own evaluation of their teachers. I know when we started with the Tulsa model and Marzano's, I spent hours in training to learn how to do those um, evaluations. They do take hours and hours and time. I knew what my teachers were doing. I walked down the halls every day. I walked in classrooms. I knew what my teachers were doing. I could hear it as I walked through the halls. I had everybody on task. I didn't need a piece of paper to tell me who was doing a good job. And I certainly uh, had the opportunity doing that to talk to teachers in the cafeteria, in the hallways, whatever. Did you think about doing it this way? I saw something in your classroom today that I'm very proud of. I spent hours in lunchroom uh, doing cafeteria duty every day. I talked to my children. I knew my children. I knew what they were learning in their classrooms. I could control and do lunch duty in the cafeteria with 150 kids, no problem, by myself because I knew my children. I knew what was going on in the classrooms. And I loved to hear from my kids to tell me what they had learned that day. So. We've got some things working to eliminate some of that paperwork, and you're exactly right. Mandate on top of mandate on top of mandate from people that don't know what it's like to be in the classroom. That that is exactly right, John, and I, I appreciate your words. You're you're right. Part of my job in the legislature is to see how I can help. Um, help you all in the classroom, help you in higher ed. I spent two years working for UCO and my job was to supervise student teachers. That put me back in the Middale School District, Choctaw Coma Park School District, Hera, Luther, Jones, Moore in Oklahoma City. So I know what's going on in our classrooms. I know we have great people doing great jobs. Senator Garvin's back with us. We were uh, we were hoping we'd get you back. So now I told him run you to the front of the line. We the question to Senator Stanley was what's in the pipeline, uh, no pun intended, legislatively, what are your thoughts in terms of bills you're authoring and in terms of getting something done positively for the teacher pipeline this session? Sure. So um, I have a bill that I'm really passionate about, Senate Bill 1119. It is essentially removing the cap on the hours that adjunct teachers can teach or be in the classrooms in Oklahoma schools. Um, to Senator Stanley's point, we continuously put mandates that, in my opinion, are very arbitrary. Um, I've never been in education professionally. I, I did substitute teach one day in Blanchard Public Schools a couple months ago, and that was my my claim to fame for teaching. Um, and, and I, you know, was a cheerleading coach in several different public schools. But as far as being in a classroom, my time is limited to about eight hours. So, um I, I look at the teachers at my kids' school 
and the leadership at my kids' schools. And I'm thankful. And I think it's extremely frustrating that there are individuals in the legislature and out of the legislature that are pushing this narrative that bad things are happening in public schools, that that there are bad teachers teaching evil things. Um, I got a letter yesterday from a constituent informing me of all the evil that's going on in public schools. And it's just not true. That's not the normal. Now, yes, there's bad there's bad teachers, there's bad superintendents, there's bad attorneys and doctors. And I mean, you're going to get those those bad actors, if you will, in every single profession. Um, but my time, I feel like needs to be spent in whatever time I have left serving in the legislature um, using common sense and taking away arbitrary goals and arbitrary numbers that that truly don't make a positive impact on education in Oklahoma. So I'm really proud about this particular bill because again, it removes caps of very highly educated, highly skilled professionals that can be in our classrooms, teaching our kids and, and exposing them to what real life looks like. Um, so what does that look like? It might be a farmer and rancher who wants to go in and teach an ag program that has had you know years and years of working in 4-H and working with the FFA kids and that's what they wanna do. Or it could be someone like my dad, who's a physician, he's a, an MD and he speaks fluent Spanish. And it could be someone like him that wants to go into a classroom and, and teach um, English to individuals who are Spanish speaking or vice versa. Um, it may be someone who's owned a daycare for 30 years who has an established curriculum and wants to go be a preschool teacher. I mean, we are limiting the people that we are exposing our kids to. And, you know, quite frankly, some of my favorite teachers when I was in school were emergency certified, alternatively certified, and they're still there and they do an incredible job. Um, one of the teachers of the year nominees, uh, finalists, actually, Lisa Hefner from Duncan, she was a business owner for years, and now she teaches a business class at Duncan Public Schools, and it's wildly successful. And it's because we're taking and, and thinking outside of the box, but we're taking industry professionals, exposing them to our kids and letting them have real world um, application of, of the professional career paths that these other people have chosen. So um, I think it's good policy. I think we have to, as Senator Stanley said, continue to move forward to remove barriers, not only for school districts, but also for teachers. Hey, Senator Garvin, a follow-up while we still have you. This is long <laughs> yeah. street. It's run for, so you spoke, <laughs> you're, you're down in Southwest Oklahoma, but everybody's been talking about this Project Ocean, which we have no idea who it is to Panasonic. But anyway, the whole point is you spoke for it the other day. You said, this is really good for our part of the state, but this is four to 6,000 jobs. You're working on a teacher pipeline bill. My question to you, doesn't this really across the board, people need to look at this as we could be losing teachers, career educators to go do something with a Panasonic when they get there, they're going to be paying a lot of money. Doesn't this really, really, uh, encourage people to look at this and go, yeah, we've got to improve the situation for career teachers. Otherwise we're going to, it's, you know, you look and see what's happened to the restaurant industry when the medical marijuana industry came to Oklahoma. Okay. You saw the drain from that industry into the other. I know y'all are working on that one as well, but doesn't this beg the fact that this is, we've got to do something for career, pay more for professionals because of things like what this project ocean represents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and quite frankly, this is not an issue that we've only been facing since COVID started. Teacher pay, uh, education funding, all of those things are issues that have gone on in Oklahoma for years. Um, so one of the main reasons why I supported Project Ocean is the trickle down effect. I mean, I, I live in Duncan, like I mentioned, although we may not be the home of um, great internet service, we are the home of Halliburton. And the the manufacturing alone that goes on within our community based on the oil and gas industry and and has had an impact on this community for a hundred years um that's the kind of trickle down effect that we're looking at when we look at at massive 
corporations or um, even small business development. And so I'm, I supported that legislation because I'm hopeful that it can have a trickle down effect into other areas of the state where manufacturing is happening, like Duncan. Um, but to that point, um, you know, we've got to continue to push out skilled workforce. We have to continue to recruit and retain teachers. Um, and I've heard several other legislators, I don't know if Senator Stanley would agree with me, but I've heard other legislators often say sometimes teachers are their own worst enemies. Um, you know, I have a couple ideas for some bills for next session that I've looked at um, and, and been researching already. And when I've spoken to um, teachers or superintendents or even representatives with different uh, teacher based organizations, it's an immediate no, 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 we can't do that. It, they don't try to think outside the box when when the transportation bill came up, which was, um, you know, we had the open transfer last session. This session, we have a bill that would help provide transportation services to individuals who want to transfer into another district. I can't tell you how many people were so adamantly opposed to it that are in the education space. And um, instead of thinking, hey, this would give us an opportunity to recruit students into our district, they automatically looked at as a negative. And so I think one thing that we have to do is shift the narrative in education, um, but it's got to start, it's like the chicken and the egg. I mean, we have to start somewhere. And, and because educators are getting so much negative attention for all this junk that's really, truly not being taught in our public schools, um, or at least not a majority of them, um, we're going to continue to push people out of the education space. And so, you know, I think it takes leaders like Senator Stanley and myself and and the others on this call to really change the narr narrative in the public for what public schools are providing. Um, and, and it's not that I'm against private schools. It's not that Senator Stanley, I, I don't think, is against public or private schools. It's just that in rural Oklahoma, where I'm from, we don't have private schools. We don't have charter schools. You're either homeschooled or you go to private or public school. And um, so we've got to continue to provide good quality jobs. We've got to continue to push the narrative that teaching is a respectable profession. Um, and we have to find ways to incentivize teachers to stay and to recruit, um, to recruit new teachers. So. You know, although Project Ocean could potentially be um, a stealer of educators, I think that there's a lot of people who are really passionate about their jobs and it would take, you know, they probably wouldn't leave for a six figure salary because they're passionate about what they do. And Senator Garvin, your uh, excellence through experience bill is just one example of uh, one of the uh, innovations that could impact Oklahoma classrooms soon. And we, we talked about the career ladder bill and, and we talked about uh, uh, the need to reestablish teacher autonomy in the classroom. If, if for a second we can uh, look to the positive, the, su the successes that are happening right now, right now the innovations of each of you, uh, Dr. Anton, from a, a, a college perspective, what are some of the things as you look out at public schools in Oklahoma, innovations or successes that you're seeing right now that are working? Um, thank you for that. If I may, I want to jump back to something that John said and um, about needing to understand better the dynamics of the P-12 students and what the whys and why nots. There have been some studies done on that. And in fact, we just did one at NSU um, with a couple of colleagues of mine. And when I review the literature, salary is always in the top three, usually number one of their perspective. This is students' perspective of why and why not, um, why they want to teach or why they don't. But respect and lack of support are also always in the top three. I, and, and in fact, the study that we did of freshmen coming in, same thing. We found the same. So I agree with your comment there. Uh, yes, we have, you know, as I mentioned a minute ago, it's definitely all hands on deck. Um, as the numbers started going down and as we, we this teacher shortage nationwide, but Oklahoma has definitely been hit hard by it. Um, some of the things that we've done, we have started grow your own programs. And again, that can be lengthy. It takes you a while to see the fruits of your labor, but um, we have MOUs with many, many school districts um, where we work with them um, because the truth is we do this for them. 
And if we're not in touch with what's going in, on in the schools and their needs, we're, we won't be able to help. You know, that's why we're here. Um, so the Grow Your Own, uh, we have MOU with Career Tech, where we work with 11 different high schools, those students who think they might want to be a teacher. We offer dual enrollment classes, concurrent uh, explorations and teaching, where they can count that as an elective in their teaching degree when they when and if they do come to NSU. But keeping track of them during that time, I think, is important, too. We work with them while they're at juniors and seniors, but then we also don't lose them as they go to whatever university they go to. Then they may go to some other university and that's fine. We could, we encourage them to do that if they're going to be a teacher in Oklahoma. But if they come to NSU, we connect with them when they're a freshman and try to work with them because teacher ed programs don't start until after they finish their or are almost finished with their gen ed. And so we lose them in that gap sometimes. Um, so they're juniors usually when they're admitted to teacher education. So we've lost a couple of semesters. So staying in touch there all through the process. And, and so Grow Your Own is kind of a lengthy pipeline, but it's something we're really striving to do and, and keep better track and really uh, understand what's going on at each step. Um, and it may be, there's another piece that a gap happens sometimes. It may be that they go to a two-year college first, which is great. Um, but are we staying in touch with them there too when they go in, they, they're still saying they want to be an educator. And so keeping that continuous pipeline as it comes on all the way through graduation and then into mentoring them after they go out and they're a novice teacher in that first year. Um, another thing that we we do, I want, to, I want to be a teacher stipend and we follow those students too when they come in as a freshman, if they say they want to be a teacher, they can get a scholarship for that. Um, and we also track them, same thing. We don't wanna lose them during that gap of their freshman and sophomore years to be encouraging them if they still want to be a teacher. Um, we do have several new grants to support our students with scholarship, particularly our Native American students. As you know, uh, NSU has um, a lot of Native American students and we love that and we love our Native American community. If you look back at the history of NSU, and I, I don't know if you all know that or not, and I won't go into it in depth, but we definitely have strong ties um, with Cherokee Nation. Um, but we have grants for that through the U.S. Department of Education, and then we're a sub-awardee through the American Indian Resource Center. We also have a new grant that um, on the Broken Arrow campus for childcare for our students. Uh, while they're there taking their classes because we have a lot of students who don't may not have a place for their kids to go or they can't afford it. And so we're super excited about that. It starts in the fall. Um, we a couple of new positions that we have that have been very helpful because, as I said, we've really shifted our focus the time the day of faculty just being able to teach and not worry about recruitment. Th those days are over. Uh, our faculty assist heavily with mm -hmm. this. And uh, we, like I said, we've all got to be involved. It's all got to be a part of that. Our faculty are out in the schools. They have to be. We have to be in touch. Uh, but we have a couple of new um, positions, and they're both endowed chair positions. And one of them is for recruitment and retention, and that's what they what they oversee. And then another is for faculty development and college excellence, and they help faculty with grants and those kinds of things to help them uh, get some of these initiatives started that we that we want to do. We also are very passionate about helping um, career professionals who are transitioning into the teaching career. We know there, there are a lot of challenges there. And so we have what is called the ACE Institute, um, Alternative Certification for Educators. And um, we know that people who are already out there teaching have busy schedules. And so they're 100% online. The courses are online. Uh, there's no entrance exam. All the courses are offered in eight week format. So that means that they can start in March, June, August, October, January, and they can do those short timelines to get their classes done online. And that is for uh, many of our alt cert um, students do that. And they can take the classes they need, you know, in classroom management or pedagogy, or they can take those classes that they took and put those toward a master's in instructional leadership and, uh, get a master's degree out of it. So uh, we've done tons of curricular uh, curricular changes because flexibility is the name of the game right now and being able to kind of open up and step out of the boxes that we've been in so things happen. Um, paid internships, I think, was mentioned earlier. We've 
uh, the legislation allowed us to change our policies about paid internships. And right now, um, the State Department money going through the regents is coming to our students for a specific period of time. But school districts can also uh, pay interns now, too. So that that has been helpful. Uh, we also, you know, the traditional internships have been and, you know, there are state minimums for how many hours we almost all uh, supersede those because we believe that immersive learning and that practical experience is everything, you know, actually getting in the classroom and, and being there doing the things that you've learned about. But um, we have more flexible modes of delivery. So we have options for them so that they can work while they do the full intern in addition, maybe even to being paid. So that really helps our students out. Um, we have adjusted a lot of different policies to take out barriers. Um, I, I won't go over all of them, but there are many. We also are in the process of putting some of our education at the undergraduate level degrees online. Uh, and, you know, there I remember not that long ago when people said that will never happen. Uh, and it is starting to happen because we have to meet our students where they are. Um, we also have a, a second century advisory council that's made up of uh, school ad administrators, our faculty, legislators sometimes uh, welcome anyone to join that. Again, it's a part of that staying in touch. We, we are all boundary spanners and we're working in that third space where I'm, I've got my space, you've got your space, but we have that third space where it's like we work at the same place. Um, that's how closely we have to work with others in this situation. Right. Those are just some of the things we're doing. There are more, and I know you're not going to give me the whole hour, but I'm super excited about it. it. it it's so much, and it just uh, makes me feel very lazy because there's <laughs> so much that you're doing. And, and, and we in the media need to be telling these stories and making people more yes. aware of it. John, tell me, in the classroom, successes, innovations, things that you're seeing right now that we in the public aren't talking about or we in the media aren't talking nearly enough about? Well, speaking of that, that was one of my, when I was teacher of the year, I was trying to get somebody to, to hear this and I couldn't get anybody to hear it. But you ask a question that all of the public would like to know. And one of the things that we need to do desperately, I don't care who it comes from, the legislature, the state department, somewhere is, you know, if you go to the news every night and watch Channel 9 or whoever, you're going to see an athlete highlighted. You're going to see plays highlighted. You're going to see teams. But we don't highlight teachers. We don't highlight education. We don't show people the cool thing. I, I, one example, Elaine Hutchison out at Fairview is, is one of my good friends and former teacher of the year. And she's an amazing teacher doing some really, really cool stuff with 3D printing and with technology in her classroom. But nobody, if you're not inside the little educational bubble, you don't get to see all that kind of stuff. And we need to find a way where we partner with News 9 or whoever, the Daily Oklahoma or whatever. And we need to find a way to highlight what these innovative, really good teachers are doing, whether it's in the classroom or in the community or classroom and community together. Because the fact of the matter is, I could tell you story after story after story of some really cool things. You know, when I was traveling a lot, I, I went out to uh, Woodward and uh, Kyle Reynolds became a good friend of mine. And they're doing some really cool stuff out there that I saw in, in their classrooms and some of the things that they do. But but the point is that nobody in the general public sees this. We don't show it to them and we don't highlight that. And there needs to be a way where we like on a daily basis or at least a weekly basis say, here's your teacher of the week. And it, Elaine at Fairview is doing this and this is what it's taught her kids. And you interview the kids and you let the public see that their kids are really getting some cool innovations, some really neat things are happening. And we do that. And then not only does the public say, oh, that's cool. I'd like to get behind that and support that. But kids look at that and go, hmm, I might like to do that for a career. You know, and so that's something that we do not do. The question that you ask is one of the big problems is we don't put that out there for the public to see. And I don't know, like I said, I don't know the answer who needs to do this, but it can't be that hard. For right. us to find a way yeah. to shine a spotlight on some school systems or some teachers or some innovation, it cannot be that hard. Forgive me for saying that 15th, but it right. can't be that hard to find a way to highlight the innovation and the cool thing. Because here's another thing, going back to the money effect for teachers. And I try to tell teachers this one. People really don't want to hear teachers say, we need more money. I'm, they don't want to hear that all the time. 
decline. That just kind of wears thin on people. But when the public, I did this at Durant all the time. When they see cool things that I'm doing in my classroom or with my student council kids or that we're doing in the community, they come and ask me, how can we support that? How can we be a part of that? How can I give money to that? They do that. I don't have to go out and say I need more money. I get everything that I need. And so one of the biggest pieces to this is we're not highlighting and showing the cool things that education is doing in the state and in the classroom so the public can see that and get behind it. Right. So I, I will tell you, completely agree with you. And that's why uh, just a humble brag moment on behalf of Griffin, we started Innovative Teacher. It's just it started recently. It's uh, sort of uh, in line with what we started here with Beyond the Bell. Uh, and I would encourage any teacher, any educator who happens to be watching this, to reach out to us either through our Facebook page. We want those ideas. We're looking for them. Um, and the more we hear about them, and, and, and not just from Oklahoma City, and not just from Tulsa, we're talking from Guymon to Idabel. We would absolutely love to hear about these innovative teachers across the state. I don't want to. I don't want to humble brag, but I'll put him on the spot because of what John asks. So, and Senator Stanley and I were having this conversation a few minutes before the, we went on the air. It's basically this: media hasn't adapted well to the current circumstances. <laughs> All right, just as a as a as a monolith. And when you, when Ryan was running down those platforms and I'm, I'm going to just go ahead and get him to opine for just a moment to answer your question, John, it's one of those situations where that people don't, they're not at five 30. When I grew up was Walter Cronkite at my house. That was it is four, five, nine. Okay. Some PBS and then monolithic newspapers, them days is gone. That's like horse and buggy times, Ryan. Right. So the platforms are so varied and like I said, starting this particular platform, but you've got to be in lots of places, Ryan. You, you sure do. And I, and I will tell you, I'll just, I'll go all the way to the other extreme TikTok. Let's just talk about TikTok for a second. There is teacher TikTok and there are a number of fantastic educators that, that I'll watch, not because I'm an educator or have an educator in my immediate family, but just they help me communicate with children in my life better they're like life lessons uh and so you know wherever one looks for inspiration or look for their information i think is is where you'll find it in terms of people who uh may want to get into the business of education people who want to go from completers to stayers as they call them people who stay in the business um you know we put segments like this on all of our corporate platforms the website the news app ott streaming app but I will tell you, I think social media is going to play a big part in recruitment and, and convincing people who are in that 15 to 24 age range to make the move into education. It's uh, it's something else. Okay, so Ryan, John, thank you for that uh, last answer. Which I think is this is begging the question about social media for teachers, an episode. Okay, I mean, don't you think? We'll see about Say that. Say again, All I'm right. sorry. I was just saying, I think we, what we've heard today is that we really need to have a session really on social media for teachers, education institutions, because things are changing. I've seen a lot of people having co college courses on Twitter and Ryan tells me, and we're streaming on Twitter right now, but it's somewhere down in the, it's somewhere down the list right now in terms of reaching people. And, right. Uh, in, in terms of size. And of course we wouldn't want it to be something that you're just adding another to do for teachers, but for the teachers right. who have to be passionate, you know, it's like, yeah, if, if, you know, TikTok's not your thing, that that's fine. But boy, you can reach a lot of people that way. Yeah. I like to uh, quote Vaynerchuk, John, if you, and uh, Dr. Anton, Senator Stanley, Senator Gard, if you've never looked into uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's content, which Ryan Welton turned me on to years ago. He's got it. By the way, he's a college dropout. Uh, the interesting thing is, is we've been watching the, the dropout, you know, the deal about Theranos. But the, the fact is, is that you have to be, you're day trading for attention. Education is, and got to learn how to be in all those places. Right, Ryan? That's absolutely right. Okay, we're getting close to the hour. I, I want to, uh, to the end of the hour, I want to thank our group. And I'd like to take just a moment, uh, start with Senator Stanley, Senator Garvin, uh, Dr. Anton and John, if you just go around final comments where we need to go, what the public needs to be doing right now in terms of helping the effort, the ongoing effort to improve that teacher pipeline. Senator Stanley, if you'd lead off. I would love to. 
Uh, first of all, thank you for letting me have this opportunity to be on today. I think we are keenly aware in the legislature of things that we need to do to make our teacher pipeline better. Um, jumping on to what Senator Garvin said, I also supported Project Ocean. Um, I think that's going to bring, it's, it's the biggest opportunity we've ever had in this state to uh, develop our workforce and to bring dollars into the state. And with those dollars will come obviously tax dollars, which puts more money in the coffer, which we could use to turn around to help our, our education um, family become better in Oklahoma. I am keenly aware of the needs that we have. I know that we don't um, fund education as completely as we could, but with those tax dollars from Project Ocean, we're going to get there. I, I hope that I can stay in the legislature long enough to see us be uh, one of the top 10 states in education as um, our governor is so desiring, and I support that 100%. Um, we have done a lot with concurrent enrollment, and actually a child can finish high school and have almost two years of college credit under their belts, which is huge. We are um, great in our career tech education in the state of Oklahoma. I don't think we applaud our career techs as much as we need to. We have great, great career techs in our state. I happen to have one right at well, actually, I have two. Uh, we have the Middale Votech here in my district, and we also have EOC in my district. So um, looking forward to continuing our work on education in the legislature. And I just, again, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here today. You want me to go next? <laughs> yes, Senator Garvin. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, um, I would just again mirror everything that everyone has said here. Um, I also am very blessed and, and very thankful for the opportunity to come visit with you. Um, I I guess the last couple of things that I would say um are to teachers um and educators, don't don't think that every single person in the Capitol or that every single person in the state of Oklahoma um, believes what, what the loud minority believes, which is that there is so much negative negativity, um, and hate and all, everything that we hear from the national scene. Just please don't believe that we all think that that narrative is accurate. Um, the second thing I would say to parents, um, Yes, it's imperative that you are involved in your child's education and that you help to make educational decisions for your children. Um, as a parent myself who has three children in a public school setting, um, sometimes I believe it's my job as a parent to kind of move out of the way and let the professionals do their jobs. I wouldn't go into a doctor's office and tell a physician how to do their job, wouldn't walk into an attorney's office and tell them how to do their job because I'm neither one of those things. I'm also not a teacher. Um, find a school district that you believe that knows what's best for your children and helps bring you along in the conversation. Um, but put your faith and your trust in those people once you've selected that, that opportunity or that best school district for your kids. My kids feel loved when they come home. My, my kids are full of joy. They feel safe. And um, that's what we get at Marlowe Public Schools. And, and my kids are proud outlaws and I'm a proud outlaw and we'll continue that tradition. And so I would just encourage um, parents to, to be involved, but to also um, don't believe everything you're hearing on, on social media and on the national scene, because that's just really not what's happening in Oklahoma schools. Um, so we will continue to do as much as we can in the education space over the next at least two years that I'm there. And um, if God calls me to do more, we'll see. But um, we've got to be reform minded. And, uh, you know, I think I think we'll get there. And with, Brent, with Senator Stanley, I think that we'll get there. So, by the way, Senator Stanley, I went to pour a little coffee in my EOC mug here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Also, we also have phenomenal career tax in, in District 43 as well. <laughs> 
They're great. They're great. By the way, those are a lot of those are state championships won by Joey Mitchell. That's where he received his training at EOC. It's how part of this program has developed over the last couple of years is because of his digital guidance. So I just had to, you know, shout out to Ben Halavity and all the folks over there at EOC. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Anton, while we're talking about uh, education, if, if you have some closing thoughts yourself. Yes, um, I definitely, uh, Senator Griffin, kudos to teachers. I'm telling you, we have outstanding teachers in Oklahoma. Um, I go out into the schools, our faculty go out into the schools, and there is some really, really amazing stuff going on. Um, so first and foremost, that. Um, and Senator Stanley, also with your comments about um, those MOUs between you know, where students can go concurrent or dual enrollment and get their gen ed taken care of before they ever even get to the university. We actually have a, an MOU with Broken Arrow Public Schools and TCC and NSU where we do that. And so those those are the kinds of things I'm talking about working in that third space where, you know, you used to be here, here and here, but now you're here. Um, and changing the narrative on teaching, I think um, is a, a big one. This is one of the most important professions, and it is a profession that there that is out there. There wouldn't be any others without it. If people can't read, do math. You know, it, we we have to have that basis for teach for students, all students in P through twelve. Um, so more positive PR and some of the stories that we've talk, talked about. How do we do that? Um, starting at a younger age, I know that over time. That has definitely gotten better. We do career exploration now through legislation um, at a much earlier age and through high school. Uh, that wasn't necessarily the case when I was in school. And so we definitely made some progress there. Um, having quality, effective teachers in the classroom as mo role models for students. Uh, I think that plays a big role too because as I talk to students out in school, I taught a class at a, high, at a career tech last week for high school students. And I actually asked them, you know, why do you want to be a teacher? And to a person, almost, it was about a teacher that they had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, and we, we do interviews as teachers come in, as teacher candidates come into our programs, we do an interview when they first start. And that's one of the questions we ask them. And that is often the answer. We, we also hear things like, my mom was a teacher, my aunt was a teacher. You know, there's generations of teachers. We hear that too, but teachers make a difference. They make a difference for the rest of their lives. And so I think those are all really important things. And then of course, um, the other thing is we have to do this together. Um, this is not new stuff. This has been going on since education, you know, the beginning of education. I read a book called Teacher Wars by uh, Dana Goldstein. And reading that, I realized that many of the things we did, we're dealing with today, we've been dealing with for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. So as, as I believe Senator Griffin said, you know, it didn't all just sprout out of COVID. It might've been Senator Stanley, but anyway, um, and then I'll wrap it up with, we have outstanding teachers in Oklahoma. Yes, we do. And uh, that's the perfect segue for our last comment to John Hazel, the 2017 Oklahoma Teacher of the Year. John? Well, riding off the back of what Dr. Anton just said, one of the things that I used to say when I spoke around the state and everywhere was the proof that we have excellent teachers in Oklahoma and that our educational institutions are doing a fantastic job is that every stinking state in the union re recruits our teachers. Uh, <laughs> Texas used to put Serious. Texas used to put ads in our papers trying to get teachers to come to Texas. Every time I spoke in an area that was close to a border, there were as many border states there trying to recruit Oklahoma teachers as there were Oklahoma institutions trying to recruit Oklahoma teachers. And not only do they recruit them, but they don't give them back. <laughs> they, they don't ask them to come back. Evidently, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Ed, education institutions in Oklahoma are doing something well that all these states want to come and take our teachers and put them in their classroom and pay them more money and I guess maybe show them more respect. And that's a message that needs to get out there, that we are producing something here that the rest of the nation wants. Uh, to, to Senator Garvin's point, I, I, wanna, I do wanna say this, that sometimes when good innovation comes out, 
teachers are a little slow to adapt or come on board. I agree that sometimes they can be their own worst enemy and they have to be willing to think outside the box. One of those that's coming up, I've seen a little bit of pushback from some people, but the teacher excellence fund where a teacher can, you know, uh, get money from the lottery can, can make more money as they work up the career ladder. If, if they're identified as an excellent teacher, they can get paid more money and they can mentor younger teachers. Uh, I want to tell you, that's a, that's a, heart's passion of mine. Number one, any other profession in the world, if you do better and work harder, you make more, you get recognized, you move up the ladder. And in teaching, it's kind of like you're stuck, no matter how good you are. And no matter what you do, you're stuck on that career step and they don't do anything for you. That's something that needs to be addressed. It's just wrong. And it's what, uh, it's what Senator Stanley said. You don't have to have a PhD to figure out who your good teachers are. Every teacher, every administrator, and every kid in the building knows who the good teachers are, knows who that are doing job. And the second thing is we lose so many of our teachers in the first five years of their career because of the difficulty in education now and a mentorship piece where these career teachers are mentoring and, and walking side by side with these young teachers and helping them navigate the waters through those first three or four very difficult years will do a tremendous amount. To, now, some people say we mentor, but we don't. We kind of got some loose, you know, and some schools do some, but we need where we actually are coming alongside these teachers, walking them through this three. Can you imagine a young teacher that's two or three years trying to go through COVID and go through all the things that we've been through in the last couple of years? My wife is still in the classroom after 37 years. She's still in the classroom teaching second graders. And she's told me multiple times this is the toughest year that she's ever had in her entire life. And so I can not imagine what it would be like if you're a young teacher that doesn't have that experience and knows what's going on like she does to, to stay. So the ability to, if you do a better job, get recognized for it, get paid for it and move up the ladder and also to mentor these young teachers and help guide them through this. This is a critical piece. No, it's not a one size fits all going to cure all the problems of education, but it's a step in the right direction and we need to take it. And then after that step, we can lead to another step that will also help us find other innovative things to do to recruit, retain teachers. John, thank you very much. By the way, Goose Gossage called. He wants his mustache back. <laughs> <laughs> I wish he ate me his fastball, too. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. And by the way, great shirt. I mean, it could not be better for a day like this. So John Hazel, who is the 2017 Teacher of the Year, Senator Garvin from uh, District 43 down by uh, Lawton Marlowe way. It's great to have you. Glad we got things cleared up on the stream just in time. Uh, Senator Brenda Stanley out here in District 42, who is now my senator after our discussion there. And got those great Botex. And uh, Dr. Vanessa Anton, who's the Dean of College of Education at Northeastern State University. Thank you all for being here, Ryan. I am fired up about the state of education in Oklahoma. You know, we, we know what the challenges are. Uh, I'm very excited to hear about the innovations and what's being discussed in the legislature, what's happening in colleges and what's happening in the classroom. I think my biggest takeaway from this is to be looking closer for the stories that are happening uh, in Oklahoma classroom and telling those for innovative teachers. Mm -hmm. Well, this, well, I've had a great time today in terms of this panel. We thank you all. Uh, we would also like to tell you we're back in what, two weeks, right? That our next be on the bill. Okay. So, uh, Senator Garvin, Senator Stanley, good luck as we go into May, which is the witching hour. We got a big kick out of this, Ryan and I, a couple of days ago, young reporters who were talking all session long, who were saying, well, this legislation's dead. And then we fall down in the floor laughing as we say, <laughs> nothing is ever dead out there as we, I mean, it's called suspend the rules, all of these things that young cub reporters will learn this along the line. Ain't nothing. It's this nothing is ever dead. They can start at any time. And all I have to is two words, project ocean. It, young it, freshman it, legislators also say it's dead a lot and then get really surprised when it's not. So it's not what? just the young reporters. <laughs> I'm still learning. Well, it is uh, great to see you all. As Senator Garvin, Senator Stanley, Dr. Anton, and uh, John Hazel. This is it for us right now. Ryan was reminding us a little bit earlier that you probably ought to be weather aware. Last thought on that, Ryan? You bet. A uh, big thank you, first off, to Every Kid Counts Oklahoma for putting this on, Beyond the Bell. Uh, for folks who are going to be out and about, 
have your phone with you. Have the weather app on. I'm, my texts are blowing up from David Payne and the Weather Center and the management team at News 9. We are looking at storm potential this afternoon. And it's not really just potential. We know what's going on. The shear's blowing low. The shear's blowing high. They're expecting storm development along the I-44 corridor sometime after 3 or 4 this afternoon. I don't know about the precise timing, but the confidence is pretty high that we're going to have storms in the Oklahoma City metro today. Have the app, have the notifications turned on. We'll be covering it on News 9, all our digital platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, you name it. All right. Final word, be weather aware. Thank you all for being here on behalf of Every Kids Count Oklahoma, Mitchell Talks, News 9, News on 6. Have a great day.